Hello and welcome to Heilman and Haver, Seattle's stage and screen experience, coming to you in podcast form from Casa de Quinn and 1111 Studios on the shores of beautiful Puget Sound. I'm Matt Haver. And I'm Greg Heilman. Back in 2020, we took to the internet airwaves to interview talented local actors and directors. Now, over 75 episodes later, Heilman and Haver is Seattle's number one stage and screen podcast, bringing you in-depth interviews with the finest talent from L.A. to Broadway to the U.K., including Emmy Award winners and best-selling authors, unsung heroes, and industry leaders. And all while keeping our finger on the pulse of the Seattle and Pacific Northwest theater scene with in-depth reviews, cast and crew conversations, and behind-the-scenes tours. Our second annual Heilman and Haver Theater Awards are coming up on Sunday, September 10th, and our list of top 10 nominees in 26 categories for both community and professional theater are online now with a link for free tickets to the event, so join us. You can find it all at heilmanandhaver.com, and while you're there, sign up for our free email newsletter so you don't miss a single update or episode. Welcome to episode 77. Joining us today is, quote, one of the great chroniclers of Hollywood lore, according to Janet Maslin of the New York Times. And, quote, a fabulous social historian and sleuth in the eyes of Hilton Owls of The New Yorker. Sam Wasson is the author of six books on film, including the New York Times bestsellers Fifth Avenue, 5 a.m. Audrey Hepburn, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and The Dawn of the Modern Woman, The Big Goodbye, Chinatown, and The Last Years of Hollywood, and Fosse. An L.A. native, Sam studied film at Wesleyan University and at the USC School of Cinematic Arts before publishing his first book, A Splurch and the Kisser, the movies of Blake Edwards. In addition to his work as an author and publisher, Wasson has written for numerous publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the New Yorker, and has won three Los Angeles Press Club Journalism Awards. He's also served as a consultant for the National Comedy Center in New York and the Film Society of Lincoln Center, and was also a visiting professor of film at Wesleyan University and Emerson College. And as a panelist and lecturer, he's appeared all over the world. In 2020, Wasson and producer Brandon Millen founded Felix Farmer Press to publish necessary books on the art, business, culture, and history of Hollywood film. And his latest book, Hollywood, The Oral History, co-authored with renowned film scholar and educator Janine Basinger, was released last year and called, quote, Hollywood's Ultimate Oral History by The New Yorker and Majestic by the Los Angeles Review of Books. Wasson's biography of Coppola's real-life dream studio, American Zoetrope, The Path to Paradise, a Francis Ford Coppola story, will be published by HarperCollins this December. And Sam joins us from his home in Laurel Canyon. Welcome to the show, Sam. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Well, it's a real thrill to have you, Sam. Uh, The Big Goodbye is one of my favorite books, not only just because I love this era, but I'm a big Jack Nicholson fan. And your writing style is so lyrical. Uh, You take this heavy history and make it so easily readable. I've read the book, like I said, a couple of times. We were talking off air. It's an amazing era, um, you know, the end of an era in Hollywood and the beginning of a new one, but so easily readable. Uh, and it's a, a, it's a long book, but it's a quick read, if that makes sense. And I want to just give our listeners a quick taste of what they can expect. This is a quick passage where you describe producer Robert Evans' reaction to Jerry Goldsmith, who's one of Hollywood's most esteemed film composers, the score that he ended up with for Chinatown. Uh, and this is from The Big Goodbye on page 259, and you say, For Evans, it was more than moonlight and ocean winds and Gatsby's green flare across the bay. It was not fantasy, but palpable evidence of a dream becoming true, the rare and shivery threshold of a measurable pleasure, the promise imagination grants the mundane, and the mountain stream through which beauty and goodness, against all probability and reason, flow down into the world of art. Wow. Hmm. Wow. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. God, and thanks. this is just and this is just one of, you know, a zillion in this book. Writing like this begs the question about movies, writing like this about movies. What did you fall in love with first? The the black and white type on the page or was it those moving images on the screen? It was movies first. It was it yeah. was always movies. Yeah. And and the movies that I first fell for were re- re- highly verbal movies. I, my tastes have since shifted to more cinematic movies. But one of the great virtues of a film, of course, is that it can bring together all these different kinds of media in a way that no other art form can. The theater comes close, but it doesn't succeed like film does. But yeah, I, I was always uh, I, I was I was always a, a movie goer and um 
the way that I reacted to movies was verbally. You know, it's the way it's the way we all react to movies. We walk out of the theater, and the first thing we do is talk. We talk to the people who we're with. So it was very natural to then write about it, especially because I grew up in LA, and so so much of social life was talking about the movies. And I think I'm a, just naturally inclined towards language. So it uh, it was right there for me. Well, your subjects are varied, uh, but they all exist kind of in, in these days gone by in this kind of romantic era of Hollywood. We're looking at, you know, talking about Bob Fosse, Audrey Hepburn, Polanski, Town, Nicholson, Faye Dunaway, John Huston, and soon we'll have Coppola. How do you choose your topics? And given that we're now over a hundred years of, of filmmaking. How do you? How did you narrow down to this specific time period? Does it just have a special place for you, or, or a special interest? Well, I mean, I'm interested in. Um, I think anyone who's going to be interested in movies is going to be interested in Hollywood, and I think anyone who's interested in Hollywood is probably going to be interested in the idea of a system, because that is what Hollywood is. We're not talking about lone artists, the way we talk about writers or painters. It takes a bunch of people to work together. So what was it about this system that produced not just one good movie every once in a while at random, you know, the way the system, if you could even call it that, might work today, but on a regular basis had a voluminous outpouring of terrific and varied films. What were the ingredients in this recipe? I think anyone who's really uh, in invested in movies is going to be asking themselves this question. And so naturally, I gravitate towards the periods at which the system was the healthiest. The 30s and 40s, obviously, what we think of as the golden era. And then again, for a short moment in the 70s, the second golden era. So that's where I find myself happiest, most engaged. And I think that's where most serious filmgoers find themselves most engaged. Well, we certainly return to these films over and over and over again. I went out and got another copy of, uh, of Chinatown to watch. You know so much after reading The Big Goodbye. Why is the lighting this way? What are some of these, these settings? Uh, why were, you know, Jack's, why were the threads he wore what they were? You know, he was a clothes horse. He loved clothes. He loved hats and shoes and, you know, all these little nuggets you picked up and the, the, the you know, the, the challenges of, you know, town working with Polanski and vice versa and the churning of the screenplay. And I get you just appreciate it a lot more. And I don't want to, you know, no spoilers here. Everybody needs to go and read the book. But I, I wanted to I wanted to, to read a quick couple sentences of how you end the book. And you said, nostalgia blurs the edges of empires. And yet it did happen, didn't it? The movies are the proof. They were made and people made them. You know, on this show, we right. really I mean, I, like that's to- That's so good. Yeah, I like- It I, is good. <laughs> I'm congratulating myself with that. I yeah. totally agree with that statement. Go ahead. Bravo, bravo. <laughs> I totally, yeah. Go ahead. But I, on our program, you know, we we started this off umpteen years ago now, you know, 70 something episodes ago, just talking to people behind the scenes, people doing the work. And that's what interests us most. It's always the people behind the camera, behind the curtain was there for this book again. And we've got more books to talk about. Don't worry. But uh, was there a single person or an event that drew you? We've talked about kind of the era, but was was there a person or event that drew you to this story specifically? And and the flip side of that, was there someone that you were able to interview? that impacted you the most personally? Well, it's those four guys. It's um, Evans, Town, Polanski, and Nicholson. And I structure the book uh, with one, uh, around, around four parts, and each part is devoted pretty much to one of these guys. Yep. The tops, the tops, as great as a the producer. The four horsemen. The four horsemen, <laughs> but not of the apocalypse, of, of, <laughs> of, the, um, of utopia. As great as a director gets Roman Polanski, as great as a movie star gets Jack Nicholson, as great as a writer gets, although I'll put an asterisk next to that statement, Robert Town, and as great as a producer gets uh, Robert Evans. In the course of researching the book, I found out some stuff about Town 
that demoted my esteem for him. But these guys are no question wildly talented. And of course, the system is what made it possible. These guys today making Chinatown, it would never happen. Yeah. It would never happen. So we have to we have to credit the system as the fifth collaborator in this. And that's really part of that's really where Robert Evans comes into this as as the head of Paramount. So to answer your question, I was equally interested in these four four artists, even more so than I was interested in the movie. Well, something I mentioned to Greg before we we started rolling was, again, you said these are four really colorful characters. But you tell their story, and and there's obviously required to make references to things like the use of a lot of cocaine, or you know challenges with relationships, infidelities, things like that. But you don't yeah. linger on those things. It's not a tabloid book. Thank you. But there's enough of there of enough of that color, I guess is a good way to put it, to humanize these people. Thank because you. Because you're talking about giants, you know, and. Um, you know, you, you don't linger on the Manson murders. You don't linger on Sharon Tate. But it, but it's enough to give context to the struggles that Polanski had in those following years. That had to be challenging because, again, this is such a colorful group of people. What was that research like? You know, how did you approach that? Keeping it an academic study of this film, but, you know, you still got to kind of touch on some of these things. The challenging part was not in the research. The research was was thrilling you know it's it's always what a great part of my job to have somebody pay me to go find out more about what i love you know yeah. i mean i don't even have to i'd rather just not have to write the book just to get paid to research it i guess <laughs> most people feel that way but no the writing is the challenging part only because you know i this book came out i think in the height of the woke madness and I was always afraid that it would be, uh, that the heart of it would be misconstrued. And I was very nervous when it came out, very nervous, um, obviously around Polanski. And I kind of just had to have a, um, a lot of quiet talks with myself and say, you know, to say, I know what I believe was right, which is this man's a great filmmaker. That's that, that's that's really why we're here. And it's my job to understand why this man is a great filmmaker. And obviously, there are biographical points to that. Talent comes from somewhere, and there's a lot of darkness in talent. I can tell you that as someone who's written about it my whole life. But of course, there are a lot of dark people who aren't talented. So let's focus in on what makes Polanski different special because he is special and all you have to do is look at the career and once i really settled into that conviction i got less afraid because i knew i knew i was cool with myself and um then i could sort of walk out there and try to address as best i could people who were angry at me for calling polanski a great filmmaker and uh, I'm relieved to say that I didn't get a lot of a lot of pushback. Well, it is about we talked about separating the art from the artist, and you'd hate to see the ability to learn from someone who's so talented just be ignored based on, on on some of this darkness and some of these you know idiosyncrasies or personality traits that that might not be positive because. You know, like you said before about we're all human. I mean, it's it's these are human stories about humans. Um, and at the end of the day, nobody's perfect. So we take what we can learn from these people. And I think you do a, a wonderful job. I, when you have black and white, any psychologist will tell you this. When you have black and white thinking, you are therefore forced to put everything into one or the other category. You end up, it's sort of like Cinderella fitting into trying to fit into the shoe that does or the stepsisters you have to cut off other pieces of reality in order to accept these people into your own conception of what's acceptable and that's actually a kind of mental illness 
is to turn a blind eye. Really, you can't turn a blind eye to anything. You have to integrate, as the therapists say, the light and the dark, the good and the bad, just like you do in any relationship. You know, we don't love everything about our spouses, about our friends, about our jobs. Um, but to say, well, I'm not going to take a job because I don't like my boss or, you know, I'm going to turn down a great opportunity because I'm not getting paid what I deserve. Where are you going to live? Where on what island of perfection are, <laughs> are, are, are you going to live? And who's going to live there with you? And, uh, you know, and by the way, who made this table that I'm sitting on? I mean, do I have to research now the person or people who made this table and make sure that they were, you know, they didn't break any laws and, and yeah, pure as the driven snow, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> you to truly live by this principle of separating the art from the artist would be to totally debilitate everything in your life because it's in pot, it's you could never leave the house. As the Star Wars nerd in me would say, only the Sith deal in absolutes. Oh, so. that, perfect. <laughs> Exa exactly right. Uh, exactly right. So um, I could talk about that for a long time. Well, let's talk a little bit more about research, if you don't mind. For your latest book, uh, Hollywood and Oral History, it's kind of a, a little bit of a bird of a different feather. You partner with Janine Basinger to weed through and digest tens of thousands of hours of talk from the American Fil Film Institute's archives. And you've taken these conversations and you've distilled them down into this book, uh, which is a wonderful book. And my question is, how do you take these pieces of audio transcripts and things like that, compile them, but make a story out of it? Oh, thank you. To compile it is one thing, but then to turn it into a narrative, completely different. Um, beast altogether. Thank you for. I'm going to tell Janine you said that uh, she's going to be very happy that you recognize. Yes, we we wanted it to be what like a conversation across a hundred years of of Hollywood and a conversation where I mean one thought followed from the next. Someone you go to a party, someone says one thing, and you say something apropos of what they just said. Then the next person comes in, says something apropos of what the person before just said. And before you know it, you've talked about the whole history of the movie business. How did we do it? Just agonizingly, you know, just the way you would do a jigsaw puzzle. We first picked all the pieces, we, we, we listened to as many of these interviews as we thought was necessary. And we would then select different pieces. Oh, that sounds right. That sounds right. That sounds right. And then we sort of dumped them all out onto the table the way you would a jigsaw puzzle. And we spent a year, you know, moving them around. Well, this could go here. Oh, wait, after Billy says, Billy Wilder says this, maybe Howard Hawks could then come in with this comment here and then uh, maybe David Picker. Oh, I remember Picker said something that could go after that. So we really had hours and hours and hours of conversation between Janine and I about this conversation. And we wanted it to be a story so much so that we didn't put an index in the book. And we did get a little bit of criticism for that because we wanted people, we didn't want people to look at it as a reference work. We wanted people to say, oh, I'm not going to read this like a story from the silence to the, the present. I wouldn't be surprised if you had one of those bulletin boards, you know, that had each of the quotes in your time together with string to try yeah. to piece the whole thing together. A yeah, red thread. Yeah. yeah. It was like that. And uh, it, it took a, a lot of back and, forth, uh, back and forth. We did split it down the middle. Janine took the first half and I took the second half. That's how we started the research. And then uh, we, we sort of looked over each other's shoulders. We switched, you know, we just kept switching back and forth. And it was a great COVID job because all we were doing was, you know, reading and talking on the, on the phone. Well, I actually went looking uh, for where I could find Nicholson and I didn't find where I could find Nicholson. And yeah. The the format is it's new, it's fresh, but you do break things down kind of by era, mm -hmm. uh, which is cool. I guess the people maybe they're not supposed to, but they wanted to jump around and kind of read about their favorite era they could. But um, really a unique take and literally, you know, from the horse's mouth. 
Speaking yeah. of uh, lines from horses' mouths, the the line from Chinatown. Keep going back to that, but you know, forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. It's been used in Hollywood now over and over. Uh, you know, decrying the current state of things, whatever those might be. Tinseltown's obviously in you know a state of upheaval right now. Strikes, the specter of AI, you know that unknown, the ever present challenge of uh, you know post COVID theater, um, you know going and streaming and things. But it's not the first time people have fretted you know over the death of film, quote unquote. Your books cover decades of history, so fall the studio system, rise of the auteurs, corporate takeover of Hollywood. You know, as a historian, you know one of the foremost in the U.S. Now, what do you think the future holds for Hollywood? and theater going as we kind of enter this new era? I think people will always want to go to the theaters the same way they'll always want to go to restaurants. You know, even though we have Postmates that can deliver uh, our our dinner if we want it tonight right to our house, we still sometimes like to go out on a Saturday night and sit in a restaurant and and go through the, um, the inconvenience with quotes of dealing with the real world and parking, you know, we, we, we do value that experience. So I'm really not worried about people going to the movies. And as we now have evidence again from the Barbenheimer weekend, you know, uh, the people, the people agree. What, what does worry me is about, is, is, is just what those restaurants are, are calling food. What Hollywood is making is, is terrible, is largely terrible. To enjoy these movies, we either have to put ourselves in a nostalgic frame of mind and remember when the, uh, you know, when when Indiana Jones was good, remember when we were kids and sort of go in with an ironic twinkle and fondness and really squint and try to see, you know, uh, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark in the rubble of the Dial of Destiny. Or, you know, we have to go in... um, and and pretend you know that camp is a high form, and um, that these movies are actually subversive um, when when they're not. So this is you know it's it's as bad as it's ever been. Will it ever die? I think it'll just get closer and closer and closer, like Zeno's paradox. You know, you can take cut something in half, and then cut that in half. You'll never get to zero. Right. <laughs> you know, you, you'll get to point zero 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 infinite one, um, but you'll never get to zero. But yes, as the book indicates, uh, Hollywood has always been in peril. Hollywood has always been threatened. Filmmakers and financiers are always worried. It's a giant gamble to bring hundreds of talented people together and have them make something that not only makes sense, but that people want to see. It's a fucking miracle to make a movie. And it becomes more and more miraculous. The dumber the country gets, the less likely they are to go to the theaters, the more comfortable they are with television aesthetics and sensibility. All of these things further imperil what those of us who love movies call film but the real the real panic is in my mind with the what the audience is allowing this oppenheimer is is really no good and so many reviews and critics falling all over themselves to praise this movie to the stars i mean beyond overpraising i mean hailing something as an event it's so far off the mark that I think it's fair to say that we've really lost sight of what a movie is and what a movie can be. So my prayer <laughs> is that we we as an audience can be re-educated. And of course, the way to do that is to go back and watch the great movies and remind ourselves, hey, wait a second, greatness. Greatness hits your heart and it hits your soul. I mean, to use two cliched concepts, but true. I mean, a, a, a great work is something that you live with forever. And we can't speak about Barbie and Oppenheimer this way. It totally perverts. It totally perverts the way that 
people go in and watch movies to um, put these kinds of ideas in the cultural consciousness. No, it's interesting you mentioned that because I just wanted to, I guess, put a, a point on that. Uh, I forget what year. It was a year that we had watched a bunch of movies and um, they were all decent. You know, we like to think we've got a decent you know, opinion of movies. But then Hugo came out and you know, we went to see Hugo. And I remember coming out of that and thinking I was just blown away because I oh. knew it was something special. I feel the same way about Hugo. I feel absolutely the same way about Hugo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you just don't uh, have, and maybe it's because Hollywood kind of mirrors society in a lot of ways. You've got mm -hmm. the 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 large gap between the haves and the have-nots. You've got capitalism kind of run amok, where st these large studios are are just putting out what's worked before. So why take a chance with something new? But yeah, I guess it's going to have to change. But can how how do you change the mentality is it just going back and trying to remind people what was good so that they wouldn't they could be a little more discerning i mean i think it's the same thing with democracy you know how are we going to get people to vote for a sensible president and not a maniac you know we have to educate people we just have to educate people and then just hope from there you know People should be choosing what movies they want to see, what president they want. But if they're not educated, then they're not really choosing. They only think they know what's good for them. I mean, that's really what education is or what, what it should be. Here's what's good for you. Here's what thousands of years of civilization have told us is good for our hearts and minds and bodies and souls. Here's what we know about goodness. And because, unfortunately, so much of Hollywood is selling itself to the young, the young, uh, it's just the nature of the young to think that the world begins with them. So they're not inclined to go back and look and say, hey, wait a second. There was this guy named Alfred Hitchcock. There was this guy named Frank Capra, you know. There were these great women movie stars, Betty Davis and Barbara Stanwyck. Maybe Hollywood wasn't just full of exploiters after all, you know? Maybe Hollywood did tell the dreams of the whole world. And of course it did. This narrative of Hollywood being, you know, a bad place is, is, is bullshit. And that that's one of the reasons Janine and I wanted to write this book is to show you, you know, the horses' mouths and say these people, you know, loved their jobs, and uh, they were free, and it was pretty much open to whomever was talented and lucky. Which isn't to say that sexism and racism didn't play a part. They're huge parts in America everywhere, unfortunately, but. Hollywood has always been more socially progressive than most every other culture. That's you'll find that true of most artist communities since the beginning of time. And so again, this is all by way of saying if we can educate, which is part of what you guys do on your in your job, if we can educate, hopefully we can steer the ship back into course. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's exactly how we feel about things um, and why we try to reach out to, uh, well, folks like yourself and also people who were at least somehow connected to some of these heroes from these these eras that we, um, you know, we really appreciate and, you know, hearken back to fondly. Chris Lemon, uh, we've, you know, worked with Patricia Ward Kelly, you know, Gene Kelly's widow. And, you know, as close as we can get to some of these really standout characters from those time periods right. that really produce some amazing work. Yeah, yeah. And and the beautiful thing about movies is that when they're great, you get it. It doesn't take, the education is merely being exposed to the work. There is no esoteric knowledge here to that it takes to enjoy It's a Wonderful Life, the way that it does, for instance, I think, to read Ulysses. You really have to have an education about the history of literature to understand exactly everything that Joyce is doing in Ulysses. To watch Rear Window, you just have to have eyes and ears. 
That's because a man, someone who is a genius made it. And two Jimmy Stewart movies, two Jimmy Stewart movies. Exactly. Yeah. That's another one. Yeah. That's another one. I mean, the, the, the depth of Jimmy Stewart, you know, sheds such a stark light on this Christopher Nolan craze. You know, there is no, there is no um, intensity in the acting, low stakes in the acting beyond just like a crisis moment no real emotional depth to these things a lot of attitude you know sadness is more than just tears in other words and great actors know that and great directors know to give their actors those opportunities christopher nolan is so busy cutting 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 taking sucking all of the the quiet profundity of moments uh, between humans, just sucking them out of the movie, it, it's hard to understand. It's hard to see him as someone who's interested in human beings at all. I will. I will actually. I was just thinking that perhaps the buzz is we're believing the marketing, mm -hmm. um, obviously. But I think if you want to look at it with a positive spin, maybe we're so thirsty for something that is good. That when we hear, when we're told something is good, we just yes. jump at it because we really yes. do yeah. want something that's good. Well, yes, the bar is very, very low and we are all starving. And when you're starving, you'll think a Big Mac is a, is filet mignon. And that's also how the wrong people can get elected. That's how you can marry the wrong person. You know, you're so hungry for it. You're so lonely. You're so desperate that you're not. You don't have your hands on the wheel. That um, scarcity of mindset. Yeah. Scarcity it, is a good it, way to put it. Scarcity is a good way to put it. Yeah. And 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 we're we're dealing with this in this modern era where we do have access to there there is no scarcity. Exactly. Uh we can literally, you know, for three bucks and the click of a mouse or the click of a remote, we can watch almost any film that's ever been made going back, you know, again, almost a hundred years now. That's so right. So there may be there may be a scarcity moving forward on you know but uh there's certainly no shortage of material but again i think it does come back to that you know that education piece and i'm i'm amazed at the number of people of my generation that you know don't know who jimmy stewart is little less ever seen a, f a f one of his films and I, I i have a lot of people to thank for exposing me to a lot of those you know those people early on as kids the black and whites it's it's really kind of sad i mean it but it is it just it's just an opportunity for education it is sad also because they haven't, it's not just amnesia because it isn't just that they don't know their history. I mean, kids don't know history, you know I mean? That's, that's, that's part of every generation. They haven't replaced Jimmy Stewart with someone else. They don't have their own Jimmy Stewart. Yeah. If they think that this Cillian, I'm not even saying his name right. If they, if they think that this is what a star is, then we're really dealing with a cultural, an emotional impoverishment that is really sad, you know, that they, that they don't know, that they accept this for depth and, and humanity. Um, the hopeful part of this is that you show any open-hearted person a great performance and they will wake up and they will slowly let go of this misconception they had that Christopher Nolan is the greatest living filmmaker or the greatest filmmaker of his of his era they'll slowly start to see and over time time will erode these movies no one will be watching Oppenheimer in 5 minutes no one will be watching it you know they will however be watching Hitchcock forever so in the long run I'm not worried. I wish we could get to the long run quicker, though. Well, and that that brings us to the next question: would be, you know, where do you see, where do you see salvation coming from? You know, I'm I'm actually just I, I finished up the Big Goodbye for the second time, and then I started reading um, Easy Riders and Raging Bulls, another excellent book about similar era, at least pieces of it. Uh, and it's interesting to me how many people now, in hindsight, that we consider masters. These were guys that the you know the the powers that be considered you know uh, indies at best, and you know there's always that undercurrent of independent filmmaking, 
is there is that where salvation comes from the the independent film the the film festivals and you know underground type of work is that a, where we need to kind of return to is it a, is it a turning away from the the big studios and you know i mean essentially voting with our our feet and our wallets and and focusing more on on independence that that's part that that's part of it the the troublesome part with going the independent route is that we need movies theater we need movie theaters to show independent films and that is such a big budget a, a expensive enterprise to get independent films into movie theaters that you're really if you're you're really only talking about a handful of independent films that go every step along the way um, from conception to exhibition to get the the theater time that that they that they need and deserve. So it's not as simple as just voting for the independent the independent films. We need the groundswell of audiences to come together to love and appreciate the movies again. You know, unlike a restaurant, the movies do taste different on the big screen. Now, maybe a gourmet would disagree with me and say the food does taste better at a at a restaurant. I often can't taste the difference. But if we if I were to be educated by a, someone who really knew food, maybe I would taste the difference. And then I could would go to restaurants more often. That's really what we need is more people to be going back to the movies, not just for Barbie and Oppenheimer, but for everything and keep tv to what it really is which is at, at best a, a a divertisement and a news source what the newspaper is to literature is what television is to the is to to the movies get your news on tv you know um have a couple of laughs like you're looking at the comics and the newspaper you know but but do not put this in the museums, this this television stuff. I wanted to get your take on kind of, and, and it's related to what's going on in Hollywood now, and it's it's these, these large studios, but they're really not studios anymore. They're right. a part of a larger corporation. Right. Uh, you look at, you know, Universal and Disney and everything, they're so diversified in what they have. The studio piece is just that, is just a piece of it. And it almost seems like films are being made by committee. It almost seems like there's a bunch of people sitting around a boardroom talking about a movie plot or something, and then somebody will chime in and say, well, you don't want to do this because this might mean this, or you want to make sure you do this so we talk to this demographic, or you don't want to do this because it's not going to make as much money in this geographical region or something like that. It seems like the the filmmaking is getting lost in these yes. big clouds of corporations. And and I think that somehow has to change too. How do you think that can change? Because that's- I don't think of it so much as a corporate problem uh, um, because in fact, the corporations have been making movies like this for many decades. We didn't get Disney yesterday. Gulf and Western bought Paramount as we know. You know. But what is different now is we don't have filmmakers or appreciators of film running these places. You know, Bob Evans was working for Charlie Bluthorn, who was the head of Gulf and Western. But Bob Evans was a movie fan, and he loved and he loved talent. Sherry Lansing worked for Paramount under under giant corporation, but Sherry Lansing is a giant movie fan, and she loved talent. And of course, you know, um, Simpson and Bruckheimer made movies the very way you're talking about around a table by committee. I believe Flashdance started with just that. All they had was a title, Flashdance, you know. Now let's make a movie. <laughs> and Flashdance works, you know. So even that is acceptable in a way because those guys finally hired capable filmmakers. In the case of Flashdance, they hired Adrian Lyne, a very stylish filmmaker, and Jennifer Beals, and they got that hit song. And so, you know, they picked the right people to, in many cases, make their movies even when it was made by committee now it doesn't matter as we have seen you know people will go see anything you tell them they have to see 
You know, we have learned that lesson with Barbenheimer. And it's a lesson I can say, I told you so, because that's what sold Jaws. Now, Jaws, we love. We got lucky. It just so happened the movie everybody had to see was a masterpiece. But what got them in the theater was this ultra saturation selling. And what Hollywood now knows is that it doesn't matter who made the movie. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter even who's in the movie. This Cillian Murphy, if I'm even saying his name, he has no box office. This guy, no one is going to see the movie for him. And I think you could even argue with Barbie, they might not even be going for those two stars. I mean, um, what's her name? Margot Robbie hasn't opened a movie in a year. So you can manufacture a hit. You can. And that's one of the reasons it's very hard to be an independent filmmaker. Where are you going to get that Barbie Oppenheimer marketing push? Yeah, the clout. Yeah. Yeah. But thankfully, if we're on a desert island, we got we got enough movies to last us the rest of our lives. <laughs> <laughs> that's the upshot. Well, speaking of someone who's, whose movies will last forever, I want to switch gears and talk about your upcoming uh, book, uh, a Path to Paradise, a Francis Ford Coppola story. I want to know what led you to Coppola and American Zoetrope as a topic, and and what can readers expect from this new book? Well, that's it fits right into what we were talking about. I mean, with so much pessimism around the movie business and futility, I wanted to write a story about a dream that came true, a way that great filmmakers fought the system to create an alternate system. And I think you could argue succeeded, not permanently, but temporarily. And it's really important in these dark moments to think, look, it has happened before, it could happen again. Here is a path to paradise. Here's how one brilliant dreamer and group of dreamers did it. Be inspired. Maybe you can too. You know, Coppola started out the way we all start out. He didn't have rich parents, you know. He didn't know anyone, you know. He fought like hell, that guy. He fought like hell. And we all can do that. We all can fight like hell. If you have endurance and you know who's talented, I mean... Let's see where you can go. Let's see where you can go. Um, and that's really what that book is all about. Well, we're looking forward to it. Um, again, you know, your body of work up to this point uh, is so enjoyable. And you are Thank practicing you. what you preach, <laughs> uh, educating, but again, not in a heavy handed way. This, these are extremely entertaining books. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to the next one. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing what you what you have in store beyond uh, the path to paradise. How do people best keep up with all things Sam Watson? You got samwatson.com. Are you active on socials at all? No, I'm not active on. I'm, I'm just I just try to write during the day and then go out to dinner with friends at night. So I don't do much interacting on online. But I do have a website, which is just my name dot com. <laughs> You're probably going to live longer than. All the rest of us combined, staying off of social media. <laughs> I'm telling you, I think I got the right idea here. I really do. I don't know if it helps my sales at all, but it helps my sanity. <laughs> well, we'll link uh, like crazy uh, to uh, to the books and to your websites. We really appreciate uh, your time. Uh, one of my favorite uh, favorite authors, uh, especially you know, it's like you. you and Eric Larson <laughs> at oh, this point you. as far as nonfiction goes. So... We'd love to stay in touch and maybe we'll get out there and have dinner with you one of these evenings when we make it to LA next time. Great. You know where to find me and, and we'll do this again when Coppola comes out in December, I hope. We'd love to. Great. Great. Thanks, guys, so much. It was a pleasure. Thanks for letting me fight. Thanks, Sam. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep doing it on, on this show, too. Yep. All right. Great. Thanks, Thank Sam. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Well, thank you again to our guest, best-selling author Sam Wasson. His latest book, Hollywood, The Oral History with Janine Basinger, is available everywhere fine books are sold. And The Path to Paradise, a Francis Ford Coppola story, lands this December and can be pre-ordered now. 
Keep up with Sam at samwasson.com. All linked in the show notes. And if you enjoyed episode 77, please make sure to follow us and share the podcast with a friend. You can find all the latest on highlandandhaver.com, including tickets to the Highland Haver Theater Awards coming up in September. Plus all our past episodes, stage reviews, and popular segments like Get to Know a Theater, In the Mix, and Behind the Scenes Artist Interviews. As always, thank you for supporting local theater and movie theaters, and for joining us on Heilman and Haver. 